If they'd have told me what was waiting there, I wouldn't have believed them. Every minute of the day, I always knew someone was watching us. You look at them and you look at the gun and you think, shit, what have we done? I felt like I'd never seen my mum and dad again. I just remember my heart pounding and thinking, what have we done now? That wasn't my country. I shouldn't have been there. There's blood everywhere. I mean, Paul just, what the? If you ain't willing to fight for your life, then you ain't leaving it. This is hell. My life in Leicester was dragging me down. For a young lad at that age, it was boring. I just had enough of waking up, no opportunities, no money in my pocket. I wanted to run away from everything. I was working at my uncle's scrapyard. I was just really depressed. I wanted to, um, just get away from it all, really. I wanted a challenge. I wanted some adventure. I wanted to go and see a bit of the world. And I'm poor about ten years before I got arrested. This whole story began in the nightclub. It's a nightclub. I've been there loads of times. And we've seen another friend who we've not seen for a long time in there. Something stuck out about this guy. He just caught my eye. I looked at him and I think, well, he looks like something special. He looked like he'd been away. He looked healthy in his skin and he looked well off. Good clothes, good shoes, good jewellery. He had a lot of money. Back from a hot country. He told his Venezuela was every young lad's dream. Nice girls, speeches, palm trees. Jimmy says, if you want some of what I've got, there's the guy over there. I can put you on to him if you want. Jamie took us over to the Russian guy, Paul and Jim. They're interested in doing some business with you. You know, the good people from the area, so you can trust him. The Russian guy said, have you ever been abroad? And I'd never been abroad before in my life. And he said, would you get a package for me? And I said, what's that then? And he says, well, it's, it's drugs, but I need you to be honest with me and say that you could do it for me. I have trust in that. And we said, well, what's in it for us? He said, we'll pay for the ticket, but it's way off. We'll give you a four-star hotel and money while you're on holiday. So you'll meet someone, they'll give you drugs. Everyone will be paid off at the airport, so no one will be stopping anybody. He said, I'll give you $8,000 each. He says, well, hasn't anyone got caught? He says, we know. No, we've got gateways. We can get for it. We know what we're doing. It's an organisation. He said, everything's paid off. There's no way you can get caught. He was offering me an opportunity to go and make something of myself, even though it may be dodgy, but... I've only got to do it once. That's what we were saying. We'd only do the one time. Just the one hit, get the money in. That'd be it. The start of life, really, for us. I felt like I was risking nothing. I'd got nothing. I seen that as a head start in life. That extra money could have made things better for my family. I can do this. That's all I thought. I thought I can, I can get away with this. We was gullible children, as far as I'm concerned. Gullible kids. This guy wanted to do it quick. He wanted to get this moving as quick as possible. Within a week, everything was sorted. In the morning, there's a knock at the door, and it's Jamie. Get your bags, lads, come on, we'll go airport. And we knew at that time, that's it. We looked at each other as we should say, we've got to do it now. In the car, remember it being cold, raining, Horrible on the motorway. I just remember it raining on the dashboard, thinking, get out of this horrible weather. I'm going to have a break from all this. And it was like on the start of a holiday. We were going to go and enjoy ourselves. And then I just remember looking up at the sky, being in the clouds. You see the sunlight just beaming in through the window. Beautiful. It was it was a crazy view. As we touched down, my heart's just gone like, whoa, I'm in a different country now. We 
as soon as you walk out the airport, the heat just went poof. I couldn't breathe because it was a change of climate and I wasn't ready for it. All I can remember was just the heat was intense. It took my breath away. Me and Paul stuck out like sore thumbs. Everything looked clean on us. It was all brand new. They had toe sticking out their shoes. It was just a different world altogether. And there are the palm trees and there, mate, the real. Now, I'd never seen a palm tree in my life, and I'm looking at these palm trees, yeah. It was an expensive hotel. This guy had spent money, it was all professional. Very nice place, four star, balcony, everything. The marble floors and the big pillars and the three, four, five floors upwards. And the clear blue water of the swimming pool. We felt comfortable with it because we thought this man's put good money into this. It's not a back street fit, it's still looking positive. I felt free. I felt this is my life starting and this is what I make of it. That's the first sense of freedom I ever got. If they'd have told me what was waiting there, I wouldn't have believed them. Never in a million years I would not have believed what they what was waiting ahead. The first contact we got was the second day of being at the hotel. We got the phone call that he was outside the hotel. Paul was scared like I was. We knew we had to go ahead with it. It was full steam ahead from now. We got into the back of the jeep and like the jeep just pulled off. What you can just see is like these dark things in the back of this van and these guns. I've never seen someone carrying a gun before. You know, you just look at them and you look at the gun and you think, shit, this is serious. This guy's lifting my arm up and I'm thinking, what's he doing? And he's like trying to measure my inside measurement there. This is when you need to measure your chest width, hip width, and the length of your chest to the bottom of your stomach. And we said, what's that for then? He said, well, you need bulletproof jackets to put stuff in. And we said, well, won't you see that? And he said, no, no, you're OK. You wear a shirt, you won't see it. They were saying that they're going to ring us soon, take us to their apartment, put drugs on us, and take us to the airport. And that's when we knew this is it. That's the day we're going to be waiting for. And that's when me and Paul have actually come to the conclusion that we've just got to enjoy yourself with what we've got now and get on with it. Because they gave us a lot of spending money, it was $2,000 they gave us. We was just always doing something. I was just enjoying my birthday. We did shopping. We went on the beach, swimming in the sea, surfing. We went on boats. We were just like party animals, right from the word go. Drinking in the morning. We used to go down to the restaurants, ordering all this crab and exotic seafood. We were sitting there with girls. Being with the girls and clubbing. It wasn't like a load of young lads spilling beer over each other and things like that. The 
women stood there with champagne glasses and nice, sparkly dresses. It was a different scene altogether. Wherever we went, we was whistled at and shouted at and loved by everyone. Everyone was like we were film stars. We often thought about getting out of the deal, but we weren't brave enough to do that. We knew we couldn't just get out of it without anyone having to pay for what we'd already started. <laughs> we was offered cocaine by a Dutch guy, Jimmy. I'd smoked marijuana before, but never cocaine. I never tried coke before. Didn't even know how much to take of this stuff. You know, I just started going mad on it. <laughs> Cutting it off and cutting it off and making more lines and more lines. And I'm just. I've just. must have just took too much. My heart, I can feel it racing and everything was just going black. He started having a seizure where his heart was pumping really fast. And he couldn't breathe and he was sweating and going white. And I was slapping him and trying to wake him up. And then I could see again and I get blurred vision. Splashing water. Come on, Paul, what's up? I can feel my chest tightening. When I started spanning, I thought I was going to die. It scared me. I thought I wouldn't lose him. In the end, I thought, that's it, I've got to get you down the hospital. It's like really, really hot. My head is now pounding. I could feel my heartbeat in my head. I just picked him up and threw him in the back of the taxi. Told the taxi driver, get to an hospital. God, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die. Where's this shit? What have I took? I thought he was gonna die. I'm gonna die, I'm panicking, I'm panicking, I'm panicking. And I carried him into the hospital and got a doctor to come. They gave me an injection to calm me down. I'm in this hospital thinking, shit, what have I done? We slowed the holiday right down after that attack. It just made me think, no, I don't want to be doing this, because it's nearly killed my friend. I never thought that if I brought this drug into the country that I could be killing people or that I could be causing any damage to any families or anything. It was like a countdown, you know. God, it's happening now, it's happening. I just remember being in the hotel, you can hear life on the street, but inside you know you're going to be doing something dangerous. I got myself into something that I, I couldn't get myself out of, and I started to regret every moment of it. I started to uh, reminisce back to Leicester, what I'd left behind. Maybe it weren't so bad in the first place. I spoke to my mother. I felt like a little boy. I felt like I was trapped. You've, you've done it all yourself, so you've got to carry on with it all yourself. You've got to see it through yourself. No one's going to help you here. You've got to do it. The night before, it was just me and Paul. We stayed in. He was tossing and turning most of the night. I was sweating, restlessness, couldn't get to sleep, thinking, God, what have I done? I've got to do it now. There's no looking back. This is it. And when I did finally go to sleep, it was only for like a couple of hours and I was awake again. We were told to meet him outside. We booked out the hotel, and yeah, there they were. I just remember leaving the beach behind and then driving back to Caracas. It was like hectic everywhere. In the mountains, you can see these shanty houses. Just horrendous. I'd not seen that in life, and I thought, Christ. 
I felt like I'd entered a third world country. That wasn't my country. I shouldn't have been there. They took us to this apartment, and the apartment just looked dingy. Like nothing that they expected. I remember the meeting and thinking, you know, what, what are you eating? The glamour associated with pop stars, you associate that with cocaine. Then you look in the apartment, there's no glamour there. It was the most scariest part of my life and look, that I've ever experienced. I didn't understand what they was talking about. I didn't understand what they had in mind. I didn't understand what their next moves were. We was virtually puppets. There's no way you could have argued with them kind of people. You just gotta do what they say. Unless you wanted that bullet in your head, you couldn't do anything. I was just there to do what I gotta do and then go. Can't wait to get out of the apartment. I just remember feeling like, <sighs> shit, I've gotta do it. The two guys called me into the room and I stood there and I had to take my shirt off. He produced a vest. I just remember it being really, really heavy, and when he put it on my back, it was like... And I stood with my arms out, and they put the jacket on me. And I felt the weight pull on my shoulders. I knew there was far more in the jacket than what the Russian guard sent us to collect. They pulled the cords up the top here and sewn the shoulders, and they made it so it was tight around your stomach. There was no way that I could have took this vest off myself. I remember thinking, this is where you come to get kitted up. I remember thinking, people have been here before me. But I knew now, I was going to see for myself. I just looked to myself in the mirror and I just thought to myself, God, what have I got myself into? But it's already on me now, they've sewed it up to pay for my holiday, to pay for everything else. It's just like walking into a brick wall. And. There's no, there's just one way forward now, there is no turning back, that's it, you, you're there. We waited till the lady gave the nod, you're okay, go. And then they walked us down to the taxi, paid the guy and walked off and that was the last time we seen them. It feels like a straitjacket to be honest with you. You can't get out of it and it's just strapped to you. You can feel the packages digging into the side of your ribs, and you just want to get it off you as fast as you can. I remember Jim just turned around and said to me, this stinks. I was scared that people would smell it on us. I was scared that people were watching us all the way to the airport. I was paranoid completely. We stopped talking because we didn't know if the cab driver was in on it. If this taxi driver's involved, and we do make a wise move, we will get shot. You get outside the airport and you see all the police around you and all the National Guard and you think, shit. I was scared, but I couldn't show that I was scared, so I was trying to hide it. Just remember my heart pounding and just feeling scared, thinking, what, what am I going to do now? We walked to the main entrance to the airport. I just remember I wanted to stay well away from as many police as I could. I felt like the jackets were obvious, not to see, but to feel. If you bumped into someone, you'd know that there's something there. we have been stood in the queue for about 10, 15 minutes. This guy come up to us and he's coming like quite close to me, this guy, and I'm thinking, I don't want him to come close to me, because if he touches this, he's going to know straight away what's on me, and that's it. Game's over. He's like, come on, I'll give you an end. And I've like shouted at the man, no, I've told you, I'm OK, thank you. He's like, OK then, OK then. Left us. Jim, Jim's like looked at me. Says he didn't need that. I've turned around to go through the immigration, and I can remember seeing this guy standing there with a shirt and tie. I just remember thinking, once I'm past him, I've done it. I've had my money. Corner of my eye, I can see the card at the side of him, and there's this dog there. My heart starts to race and try not to draw attention, looking down, and I can see this dog out the corner of my eye, I'm looking, I'm thinking, 
God, this is this is it now. The Lord had reassured me that the airport's paid off. You'll be all right, don't worry. Now I'm going to see for myself. Have they paid it off or haven't they? The dog's just like, not even interested in me. I'm thinking, well, why can't he sniff this on me? This one I was convinced, yeah, these people have been paid off. Bloke was speaking to you like he knew me. Literally speaking to me, you're all right, my friend. Oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. I'm like, that's, that's piece of piss. That was easy. And sort of straight through. I sat down thinking, I've done it. I thought I've got through the gateway. And I'm sitting there looking at Paul thinking, yeah, we've done it, mate. We've done it. That's it. And I was that confident, I just fell asleep, just dozed off on Jim's shoulder. <sighs> but I just sat there waiting. And you don't want to be sitting there waiting, you just want to get on your plane and get it over and done with. And that's when paranoia kicked in. We're just sitting there normal and everyone's looking at me and Paul. There's two men and they're looking funny at us. I thought they knew straight away that we had stuff on us. Paul fell asleep and landed on my shoulder like, and I pushed him to say, these people don't look right. He's getting more and more agitated, more and more. No, 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 I don't like it, I don't like it. I'm going, keep your mouth shut. Calm down, chill out. I'm drawing attention to ourselves, mate. But I must have been killing myself, sat there then, looking. I knew they was looking at me. I thought, come on, let's go and throw this stuff away. Come on, let's go to the toilet and ditch it. I couldn't just go to the toilet and drop that off. It just sewed on me anyway. How am I going to get that off? And you can see him getting agitated, and it's making me feel paranoid as well now, and I'm getting more nervous. And we're just sitting there, like, thinking, shit, shit, they're looking at us. They're looking at us. They shout over the loudspeaker, would you please board such and such a flight bound for England? Turn down the tunnel, see these people in front of me. I just remember like looking a bit further past me and then there's, there's these two guys that had been looking at us. And I was tired and says to Jill, look to him and I went, shit. The tunnel just seemed like it was getting longer and longer. I was just focused on getting past that man. Without him searching me. Just get on that plane and get past him. He was virtually staring at us to go to him. That's how it felt, like you knew you had the stuff. We got right next to the door. He told me to lift my arms, I lifted my arms like this, and he patted me on the sides. And that's when I thought to myself, shit. And this guy just looked at me and he just shook his head. And I thought, no way. The world just come tumbling down, I thought, what have I was gone and done? They just took me and Jim to this really small room they were being loud and threatening. It was quite scary to not know what they're saying. You just didn't know what was going on. That's when it started to sink in. We're not getting out of here now, are we? I've still got this bulletproof vest on me, and I'm thinking, just please get this off me now. I've had enough. The guy's come up behind me, he's got his pen off, he's like trying to get it off. And I just remember just taking his jacket off, and I just remember hearing the foot as this jacket hit the table. That's when I knew there was a lot of cocaine in there. As they pulled them apart, I was scared. 
I was like, well, we're done. I just remember thinking, my world it had come to an end. I ain't never gonna get out of this shit. This is it now. Felt a deep loss. I felt like I wouldn't ever get out of the country ever again. I'd never see my mum and dad again. And I've... That's it, I blew it. We were both terrified at that time. Both absolutely terrified. We thought we were going to die. They flagged the taxi down outside the airport and we got in the taxi. It just seems surreal. I mean, all that drugs confiscated off of us and just these two guys are just going to put us in a taxi and just take us like in the middle of nowhere. When I pulled up outside the Vega police station, and I just looked up at this big building, five storeys, and every window's got bars on it. I thought, they're not just going to take me to a prison, surely, straight away. I feared for my life when we arrived because we could hear a load of people shouting in the prison. You could hear knives hitting bars. You could just hear that there was uproar going on. When the police was questioned, they was looking as much as to say, you boys are going to meet your nightmare in a minute. Up them stairs is your nightmare. We walked up the stairs, police station smelled, you know, all the walls smell. We've seen three cages, and they're all hanging out of the cages, going, hey, gringo, gringo, and all this, and we're like, whoa. Some of them had a couple of fingers missing, teeth in a mess. It just looked like something out of this world. Like pulling on his jeans straight away, pulling on his clothes. And I've got five people standing around me with knives. And this guy came and he went, You give them your jacket and your shoes, as they'll kill you. I just wanted to burst out crying, but I couldn't, I couldn't cry. I didn't want them to see me cry. I thought if I seen, let them see me cry, that's it from day one, know that I've got to put a face on now. Seven thousand miles away from home, my mum's not there to help me. The guards came to us and it was the first bit of light we'd seen for four days. He opened the door and his eyes stung. That's how bad it was. He just took us to this room. The next thing you know, there's just like film crew everywhere. James Miles and Paul Lowesby were arrested at Caracas Airport with 22 pounds of cocaine strapped to their chests. I've looked at Jim and I just don't know where to put my face and I'm thinking, my mum's going to see this. Arrested as they were about to board a flight to London. Their explanation is that drugs barons forced them into it. This man put a gun to our head. Man was going to shoot me. We ain't even done nothing. You understand? All I'm here for is a holiday. All my family, everybody I know, they're going to see this, and I can't do nothing about it. I got to speak to my parents a week and a half after being captured at the airport. My mum, she said that she loves being what, whatever I do, it don't matter, I'll always be a son. And that was the first time I cried after I spoke to my mum. I come back and cried. I said to my mum, sorry, didn't know what I'd done. But I, I, just, I, don't, I didn't know what I'd done there. I don't know why I left them, I don't know why I left my mum, I don't know why I left them like that. I'm really sorry for what I was doing. I don't think I could have apologised. I couldn't have found words to say anything. I don't know. Just, I'm sorry. There's an atmosphere in the place, and you could cut that atmosphere with a knife. When you look at their eyes, they, they, they've got no 
no sense of nothing behind them. I heard someone getting raped. Hey, somebody get raped? Knowing that you can't do nothing for him and he can't do nothing for himself. I don't know, because he probably got a gun in the back of his head or in his mouth. That was the worst for me and Paul. Because we could hear it, but we couldn't do anything about it. That was bad. You are at your wit's end. There's nothing you can do. There's someone could come in through that door at any time of night. You never know if they was going to be armed or not armed, or what frame of mind they was going to be in. Today, in a dramatic and astonishing turn of events, James and Paul were sentenced to four years for possession of drugs, but not trafficking. trafficking, trafficking, trafficking. After being in La Vega for a year and a half, I knew we wasn't getting out, and I knew that no one could do anything, not even lawyers. Our money wasn't doing anything. We were stuck. We managed to get a, a camera on for Jim's family, and basically we just bribed the, the policeman to take the camera in there. I see that that person in that video needs help. To look at myself like that and see myself in that state, that's not me. It's like a possession. You see the dark side of yourself. At times, you just fade off into that just to get you by things. And it was like, I don't think I'll ever see my mum and dad again. The English government thought it was protecting us, but me and Paul knew we was more at danger there than we were at maximum security prison. I've been warned about it that many times, oh, you don't want to go to the prisons. They kill each other and you can buy grenades in there and you can get guns and... You don't know whether to believe it when you're in the police station. But yet, I felt like I was rotting away in there. I'd just rather go down fighting and in danger than just, like, rotting away in this little place. They just took us out of the police station, threw us in the back of this National Guard jeep. You can just see like a perimeter, fences, guards standing in these toilets. You think, God, it's like something you've seen off the film. The guards are there to guard the perimeter, and the prisoners themselves run from the prison. Walking in there, seeing them people disfigured, limbs missing, and after that, seeing all the guns and all the grenades that went with it, it was ten times worse than any hell. I've seen somebody that's been in the police station with me. He said, remember what it was like in the police station? And I said, yeah, I said, well, get out your head. It's because it ain't like it here, mate. It says, here, you, you fight for your life. And if you ain't willing to fight for your life, then you ain't leaving it. This is hell. It was very scary because it was a whole big scale of everything. I and mean, we were only two English lads in there. It was the first week of his being there. Our cellmate said, have you ever seen anyone die? We said, no, he said, well, someone's going in today. I stood there, chatting away, waiting for this food. I was going bang. Like a ringing in my ear, 
I just turned around and just looked at this guy and he's just like got on the floor. He's been shot in the head and all his brains hanging out. There's blood everywhere. And me and Paul just what the couldn't believe it. I didn't been there two days and someone's just been shot in front of me already, his brains hanging out all over the floor. And after that, it was just a normal thing to be doing in prison to them. Three people a week, four people a week, five people a week. Just getting killed. It's all about power, possession. Who's got the most drugs? Who's got the most armor? Who's got the most bullets? Who's got the most grenades? Life doesn't mean nothing. It means a pound that the bullet cost. And the man who's got the guts to pull the trigger. You feel like you're ducking and diving for your life every day. You'd lay there at night and think, well, tomorrow, will I get through tomorrow? Or will I get through this week? Or will I see my mum and dad again? You're now living their society, their world, their rules and their laws where there is no moles. Moles don't exist. You just get to the stage where you just become one of them and you just live like them, you live with them, you do everything that they do. Just to survive. I'd been there for four years. One day, the embassy came to give us some money and um, letters from his family. She comes round to let people know how the sentences and the cases are getting on. And uh, me and Jim's names was the first to be called out. We thought it was coming up for a benefit, ready to go free. Jackie from the embassy, she was there and she said, the prosecutor, she's not happy with your appeal. It looks like you're looking at a 10-year sentence. And me and Paul were just devastated. You just feel like it's exploding. Literally, like, kicking the gate straight off. I just wanted to shoot every human in that room. I just thought, I'm never getting out of this hellhole. That was the breaking point. I thought, the English embassy just gave me ten years. We'll sod the English, I'll be Venezuelan. Might as well say I'm Venezuelan now. And I'll act like a Venezuelan, I'll live like a Venezuelan. Three lads just walked up to me with a gun and said, do you want to hang around with us? And I said, what do you do? He said, we play Russian roulette with the guns and we shoot people and we just mess about. And I said, all right, come on then, let's go and do it. And one day they gave me this 9 millimeter and I just thought I'd walk around the prison with it, just show it everyone. Just show everyone that I've got a gun and that, that I want to use it. That's the life I want to live. I'm walking outside and they're usually just walking around with this crazy face on him, arms folded, see the 9mm and he's just walking round and round and round and round and round. I walked up to him, put my eyes, I says, can't get what's the matter? And you see him, you see he wants to cry, but he can't. What's the matter? I'm going to show them. You're going to show him, kid. I'm going to show him you ain't messing around with me, I've had enough now. Anyone who's gonna come and try and mess with them, show them they're gonna get it. And he just became one of them playing mushroom roulette with guns. I mean, what kind of normal person does things like that? The lads wanted to play mushroom roulette one day, they just said, You ever played it? I said, Not really, no. So, the lads span it. And I've gone click, but it's, it's empty. And he's done his turn. Third man's done his. And there was one lad who weren't even in the gang. And one of the guys walked up to him like that. And he was lucky it didn't go off. But the guy was like, whoa. see a friend do something like that 
and play around with their own life, I knew that he must have been at some serious stage. As if to say, well, you know what, I couldn't really give a fuck. I rang my mum and dad up and said, I don't ever want to see you ever again. Imagine how that must have been for them. No self-esteem. Gone. No more need to go on in life. Wanted to end it. What are you doing? What am I going to do if you're not here with me? What am I going to do if you go away? I just wanted to see my mum and dad and my family so bad that I weren't going to be willing to be taking my own life. I would have done anything in my means to get back home to see my family and friends. Anything. It was on Saturday, and we heard everyone shouting, here's the judge, here's the judge. The judge come into the actual prison to release prisoners from prison there and then. So we've grabbed all the paperwork. And me and Jim just thought we'd try a look. So we just asked if we could see this judge. Just and says, yeah, you've got all your credentials, you've got everything you need. Yeah, we're going to let you go free. And me and Paul were just... Then she says, right, you can go free, but you have to find a job and then go to work every day in the week. You have to go back to the prison and every night up until 2007. As soon as I was let free, I was thinking about the escape. There was no way I was going to stay there after I'd just done five years. I knew that I wasn't going to stay in that country any longer. I couldn't wait to go. In their law that stated that anybody in their country has as a form of identification, my ID was a passport. As soon as the embassy gave us his passports back, we could see that we could make the escape. If we went together, that would be the craziest thing we could have done, because we'd come into the country together. So we both planned that we'd, we'd leave separate. So we arranged that Jim would go through the Venezuelan port and I'd go through to Colombia. It was the first time in four years that I'd been separated from Jim. It felt strange just for my friends to go the other way. I got no money or nothing. I got a load of clothes off of a friend. I took the clothes and I sold them all. That's what I got my bus fare to Colombia with. Got on the coach to Colombia. That's it now, I'm leaving Venezuela for good. I ain't coming back. I decided to go on the run for a week until my father came. He was going to give me money to buy a ticket so I could get out of the country. <laughs> His flight got cancelled and he came the week after, so I had to stay on the run for another week until my father came. I stayed right underneath the police station because they don't look where it's obvious. They were lucky for me and they couldn't find me. <laughs> When I got to the Colombian border, I should have gone through the immigration, but I didn't want to bring any attention to myself. Everyone's being checked. If they'd have caught me, they would have sent me back to prison for six years. That was the risk I took to get back to my country. For some god on no reason, the driver just drove straight past. Didn't even pull him down, didn't even say nothing to him, didn't even nothing. <laughs> and on the other side, I rang my mum. I says, look, I've done it, mum. In Colombia, Mum. I says, I need you to send me some money. I met my dad at the airport and I collected money off him there. My dad left that night and he says to me, just ring me in the morning and make sure you get a ticket to Colombia. I said, I will. When I got to the Western Union in Colombia, it was something like £1,800 my Mum had sent over. And like £1,800 in Colombian pesos is like, pff, wads. From there, 
direct to a travel agent. This is all in the same day. Flight to England, please. <laughs> Off I went to the airport, and that was more terrifying than when I sat there with the drugs. If I'd have been spotted by a policeman at the airport, I think I would have tried to kill the policeman at the time, or him kill me. Because there's no way I would have gone back to prison. I thought, oh my God, I've got to go through this again. And it's like, this airport is like, five times as big, and like, it's Colombia, it's Bogota. Their immigration has got to be tight. Put some more courage up. Went straight through the immigration, didn't even look at me, didn't even batter an eyelid. And I knew then, once I passed that immigration, I was sat down in that departure lounge. It's over, it's over, I'm coming home. I got off the plane in Colombia, I've walked down and I've just seen this hand that I recognised and I thought, I know that hand. And as I've turned my body around to see who it is, there's Paul sitting there and I've just, we both looked at each other and gone, we've done it mate, we're, we're free, we're going home. And we just hugged each other and said, yeah, we're going home. That's it, it's all over. And there it was, there was my light at the end of the tunnel. That plane waiting for me to stand on it and go home. Yeah, my nightmare is just finished. I'm going home to my mum. I don't feel guilty anymore because I've come back and I've been back in England six years now and I've made amends. And like everybody else, we all, we all do wrong. Just try and make up for it and do better. And make your parents proud of you and the people that love you are proud of you. Because they're the ones that count at the end of the day. For me now, focus on my son and just give him the best in life. That's my future. I want to be a person that's there for his son, works for his son, secures his son. Not someone who's not there for his son, or who's in prison. Showing his son the wrong sides. I'm just there to get on with my life now. Just... Move forward. Todo palante. Everything forward. Those bloody vampires are everywhere. Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise star an interview with the vampire, next on Five.